So risk mitigation leads to, or really is the so what of risk management. So we figured out the potential for loss. Well, we provide the appropriate mitigation so that the residual risk falls within the range that's acceptable by the business. We're lowering that risk, that potential for loss, to a point that's acceptable. Because at some point in time, we have to accept a small degree of risk. Uh, or even if we don't have to, it's cost effective. You know, if you go to senior management and say, well, how long can we have our domain to be down, you know, during a normal business day? Usually the response from senior management is none. We can't afford any downtime. My response to that is, well, get your checkbook because it will cost a lot of money to give an organization 24-7 uptime. Now, who would spend that kind of money? and Amazon or many online providers where they lose millions of dollars per minutes that they're down. But many organizations, you know, may have a higher tolerance or a higher capability to withstand downtime based on, once again, cost-benefit analysis. So when I come back to senior management and say, well, get your checkbook because it's going to cost millions of dollars to get 24-7 uptime, they come back and say, well, what we really meant was two hours downtime. Right There's that negotiation process because, once again, security costs money, and we have to figure out the potential for loss versus the cost of the mitigating strategy. All right, now, when we do look at risk mitigation, there are generally three basic ways we consider. We think about reduce, accept, and transfer. Risk reduction, risk acceptance, and risk transference. So they're very much like they sound when we talk about reducing a risk. We're talking about lessening the probability and or impact of a risk. I can't lessen the probability of rain, but I can bring an umbrella and lessen its impact, right? Um, so we're, we're bringing either probability or impact, or if we're lucky, we're bringing probability and impact down, again, to that tolerable level. If I'm to eliminate a risk or avoid a risk, what I'm really doing is lessening probability and or impact down to zero. I've eliminated the risk. I've chosen not to have the picnic outdoors. I'm going to have it indoors. So I've eliminated the possibility of weather interfering with my uh, picnic. All right, so that's risk avoidance. So risk avoidance is really extreme risk reduction. Now, I'll mention, I'm going to skip over acceptance for just a minute. Uh, I want to talk about risk transference. So what risk transference means is I'm going to share that risk with someone else. When we get insurance, fire insurance for instance, it doesn't lessen the likelihood of having a fire. I'm either going to have a fire or I'm not. It doesn't lessen how much damage is going to be to the house. The house is going to get damaged to a certain degree whether or not I have insurance. What I am lessening is my portion of the loss. I'm going to share that loss with the insurance company. So when you hear about insurance, that's risk transference. When you hear about service level agreements, and those are really important in the IT world, and that's that commitment from a vendor to a certain degree of performance or uptime for a product. That's transferring the loss because if the vendor doesn't meet those uh, agreement levels, then ultimately there's usually some sort of financial compensation. So I'm sharing in that loss. So insurance, service level agreements, contract modification. This vendor's been late every time we've dealt with him. So we're going to modify the contract that says for each day late, he's going to uh, return 1% of the value of the contract to us. That's again transferring the risk. Okay, so we can reduce a risk, we can transfer a risk, or ultimately we might just accept the risk. And we accept the risk when we determine that the potential for loss is less than the cost of the countermeasure. I'm not going to spend $50 to protect a $20 bill. So I'm not going to spend more than the potential for loss to protect a product. But again, this is where it's so important I really understand the value of my asset. Because if I make the mistake of thinking, remember that laptop we talked about earlier, if I think that laptop's value is $300, then I won't spend $500 to protect it. But if I don't consider all the data that's on there and its value, I don't consider the 
potential for fines for my industry uh, via HIPAA or any of the other regulations and laws and standards. If I don't factor all those many other elements in that give value to my asset, then I'm going to make a poor decision. But when the cost of mitigation is greater than the potential for loss, we accept a risk. Okay? And what do we do when we accept a risk? Honestly, we do nothing. We have chosen to allow that risk to exist. We're going to keep an eye on it. We've documented the risk. We also have a paper trail as of why we've chosen not to implement a strategy. Because remember, we don't want to be found liable. We want to make sure that we protect the assets to the degree that's warranted. But ultimately, we do nothing. Now, it's worth mentioning that with risk rejection, you do nothing about a risk. But with risk rejection, we don't have that paper trail. We haven't done the investigation. We haven't um, set up a means of evaluating the loss potential. What we've basically done is, la, 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 that won't happen to me. And that is actually not a good form of risk management. So risk rejection is not allowed. We put it out there because unfortunately many organizations do risk rejection instead of acceptance. They don't work through and decide we'll deal with this risk um, later because of the value potential. Many times organizations just say, I don't want to hear it. We can't deal with this right now. Risk rejection is not allowed. Okay, so when we look back through risk mitigation, our big three elements, we reduce the risk by lessening probability and or impact. Risk acceptance, we choose not to implement a mitigation strategy because the potential for loss is greater than the cost of mitigation. Or we transfer risk. We find someone else to share in the risk events with us. That would include insurance or uh, SLAs. Now, a few other terms in addition with risk. Total risk, and I think I already mentioned these earlier, but just to review. Total risk is the amount of risk that exists before we implement some sort of control. So it's the total potential value for loss. If we don't do anything, how much money will we lose if we don't back up our data? That's the total risk. Residual risk is what's left over after you've applied a risk mitigation strategy and sometimes we have to apply multiple mitigation strategies. Yes, I'm going to transfer the risk of fire by having fire insurance, but I'm also going to try to reduce that risk by storing flammable material in a safe place, having good policies, uh, having sprinkler systems, those ideas. So often we have multiple risk strategies, but eventually there will be some risk that's left over and that's called residual risk. Secondary risk is when one risk response triggers another risk event. We talked about that as well. So the idea here is when we talk about risk, the vulnerabilities and the assets come together. Okay, so let me, let me reword that. The amount of threats, the amount of vulnerabilities, and the value of the asset, all that is considered to give us the total risk. These are just conceptual calculations. These aren't really things that you need to plug values in. And then when we talk about the total risk and then we add an element of control called the controls gap, that's what gives us the residual risk. So just a few extra uh, additional terms when it comes to dealing with risk. Now as we wrap up risk management, if you'll recall, three main elements of risk and then ongoing monitoring. We have risk assessment where we identify. Uh, we identify our assets and then we also have to evaluate our assets. This is a hard process. It's not easy to look at my company and say, our reputation is worth so many million dollars. It's very difficult to get a dollar value for intangible assets, but we have to. That will then lead us to risk analysis where we uh, uh, prioritize our risks based on their qualitative value and then their quantitative value. That quantitative value would then drive me to know how much money to spend or how much money I should spend on risk mitigation. Do I reduce the risk? Do I accept the risk? Do I transfer it? How do I address this risk in, ge in general? And remember, anything that talks about uh, eliminating risk is going to be wrong. What we have to do is manage risk, reduce risk. We can't totally eliminate it. All right, so we've gone through the definitions and terms. We've talked about the different types of risk. We'll talk a little bit more about governance and compliance in the next section.